Good morning, everyone. Bon dia. My name is Anya Prusa, and I'm the program associate here at the Wilson Center. I'm pleased to welcome you all for a discussion of the Brazilian government's plans to increase the country's integration into the global economy. I think this is a very timely discussion. Many countries in Latin America are looking to strengthen regional engagement in the wake of growing U.S. disinterest in multilateral trade deals. Just last week, we saw the ministers from Mercosul and the Pacific Alliance meet to discuss increased cooperation. I believe the conversation today will make it clear that the growing protectionism found in much of the developed world is not part of the policy debate in Brazil today. We are very glad to have Secretary Marcelo Estevão of the Brazilian Finance Ministry here to discuss this agenda. Monica Giboli and Teresa Terminacian will respond to his presentation, followed by Q&As. Their full bios are in the handouts by the door. But first, it is my great pleasure <coughs> to introduce <coughs> Ambassador Anthony Harrington, <coughs> Chair of the Advisory Council of the Brazil Institute, Chair of the Managing Board, and Head of the Latin America Practice at the Albright Stonebridge Group, and former U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. Thank you, Thank you Anya. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Excuse the voice uh, from the pollen, Easter pollen weekend. <coughs> um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Secretary uh, Marcelo Estevao to Washington and here to the Brazil Institute at the Wilson Center. Um, Paolo uh, Sotero sends his greetings. I think he's uh, still searching for Easter eggs in uh, <laughs> Montana. <coughs> um, the Secretary joins us at a time of change, uh, both uh, for Brazil, Washington, and elsewhere around the world, as we were chatting uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, convening. Um, although it's unclear to what extent uh, President Trump's uh, economic and trade policies will reflect his campaign promises, um, he does seem to be learning to change his mind these days. Uh, his decision to withdraw the U.S. from the Trans-Pacific Alliance has had a uh, significant effect on the landscape of international economic integration uh, and trade. <coughs> Countries that have looked to the U.S. for uh, many years for leadership are now looking a bit more to some other partners and to themselves, uh, self-help and uh, what uh, can be done in that regard. Just last, last month in Chile, the remaining TPP countries uh, met with representatives from China, Colombia, and South Korea, as most of you uh, probably know. Yet, as protectionism gained support in the U.S. and elsewhere across the developed world, Brazil seems uh, poised to be moving in the opposite di direction. In recent weeks, Brazilian officials reaffirmed their commitment to securing new trade agreements with Mexico, the European Union, and perhaps the Pacific Alliance. In uh, an interview last month, Deputy Foreign Minister Marcos Galvao said, there is a rare moment of consensus in Brazilian society regarding the need to open the country to the world economy. We need to be more present, more effective, and more competitive. <clears throat> this uh, consensus undoubtedly stems from growing recognition that rebuilding the Brazilian economy will require not only domestic reforms, but also greater international engagement. As Secretary Estevao will discuss, this, re this reorientation encompasses both a renewed focus on international trade and a greater engagement with international financial institutions and organizations. As ambassador to Brazil, I saw firsthand the potential uh, for Brazil to become a prominent voice internationally on trade and other multinational issues. Despite the difficulties that uh, Brazil now faces, I believe the crisis can leave Brazil stronger if it results in a more open and competitive economy. The challenge, of course, is to move beyond uh, rhetoric uh, and 
to move toward implementation, adoption and implementation of new policies and reforms capable of increasing economic productivity and deepening uh, economic engagement around the world. As President Obama's first chief of staff famously said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, often serious reforms do not happen uh, without some sort of crisis conditions that uh, provides the political will to make changes. In that case, uh, there was, um, uh, it led to uh, long-awaited adoption of the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, about which there's been a little bit of discussion recently. Um, the Secretary's background makes him very well positioned to be speaking to us today on these issues uh, and the challenges and opportunities regarding Brazil's insertion into the global economy. Se Secretary Esteval joined the Brazilian Foreign Ministry as Secretary of International Affairs in late uh, 2016 after many years of experience in the financial sector, uh, roles at the International Monetary Fund, the U.S. Federal Reserve, and uh, also working in the U.S. Uh, asset management uh, industry. So thank you again for being with us, uh, Marcelo, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you're going to be changing the exhibit for me? So I, I need to have little signs for you, is that it? Uh, if you want, we can just trade places. Let's trade places, yes. <laughs> I'm not very good at sending <laughs> subtle signals, as you're going to see. <laughs> Thank you. So when you click on your page, <coughs> She's right. She's right here. I don't know. Can, can we do it? It doesn't matter. Okay. <coughs> so first of all, thanks so much for the nice introduction. Let me just correct the record a little bit. It's a matter of pride. I'm the Secretary of International Affairs of the Ministry of Finance. Not what foreign affairs. What did I say? Foreign, foreign affairs. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, which is okay, but as you are going to see in my talk, that's a matter of pride. Um, th this is a little bit of, a, I think, a talk that in general you don't hear from a Brazilian official because um, I want to talk about things that are not necessarily sexy. So I'm not going to talk about social security reform. I'm not going to talk about what the central bank is going to be doing going forward. I want to talk about what I'm doing my day-to-day, -day, basically, which is uh, dealing with anything that is international in the internet and that involves the economy. So, um, which is kind of nice. There's lots of things going on, and uh, I think sometimes it doesn't get as much uh, press or attention because Brazilians and, and all of you, I mean, foreigners are really focused on the great domestic challenge that we have, in particular the political crisis and social security reform. Um, let's see if I can, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what I would say is the international insertion of Brazilian policymaking right now. First, participation global governance as a means to boost a new domestic agenda of structural reforms and inclusive growth is incredibly important for us. Um, and uh, we are going to see that uh, as I go along. Um, every single meeting that I am, and I am outside Brazil once every other week, uh, is, is, is really the agenda is, is this meeting relevant to make Brazil grow more and be more productive? So it is a domestic agenda that you are implementing through our participation in the international organizations, like it should be. Um, so basically, it's part of a process of fostering sustainable economic development, which in our view must encompass multilateralism. Mm -hmm. So it is a government that is very, very committed to the international organization and the multilateral way of doing policy, including trade. 
Uh, and we do think that a global environment with more trade investment brings opportunities, brings challenges to every country, but we are certainly not part of the group of politicians, I would say, that look at um, multilateralism with skepticism. We actually embrace it. <coughs> so what's happening in Brazil, and you know as well as I do, uh, even though I may see things a little bit differently because I'm inside the government. As you know, we are in the middle of, of uh, a movement to do structural and microeconomic reforms, and the big objective here is to increase productivity growth in the country. Uh, you're going to see later how productivity uh, uh, growth in Brazil has been really completely uh, 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 null, actually, in the, in, in the last couple of years, actually negative. So when people talk about the productivity problem in developed countries, it's a bit funny to me because the productivity problem in Brazil is, is really completely um, a crucial issue to be discussed. Among these reforms, so I would say that the current government is instituting reforms with the objective to improve the business environment. That is, if, if in one sentence I could say what this government is about is, we want to improve business environment in Brazil. How to do that? Well, first, we are doing a pension reform. That is, without a pension reform in Brazil, we basically cannot have sufficiently good macroeconomic conditions to even start microeconomic reforms. The pension reform is part of a package of measures that is, is being introduced to keep that on a sustainable path. The first one, as you, you know, was the institution of a ceiling to uh, fiscal spending that was introduced in December of last year. To make that ceiling really work, you need to now do several reforms. One of them is pension reform. We are also working on, on simplifying the tax system. One thing, that I, I one thing that happens to me almost every day when I'm in my office in Brasilia are uh, representatives of foreign countries complaining how hard it is to do business in Brazil simply because the tax system is too cumbersome and too costly. We are working on that. Of course, we, are not, we haven't sent any me real measure out yet because you're waiting this first phase of reforms, in particular pension reform, to pass. There is a law in Congress that tries to make labor relations more flexible. It is not a full-fledged uh, uh, um, reform of the labor code, but it's an important one because it deals with the ability of firms to set hours and to negotiate several parameters of labor relations that before was purely legislated and not clearly, uh, uh, so it was not quite clear for a firm hiring an employee what was uh, the ultimate uh, labor liability. So this law tries to address some of these issues. I would say that maybe it's the beginning of a, of a bigger um, rethinking of Brazilian labor relations, which I'm not sure will happen during this government, but should happen at a certain point. Um, and then there's a, a broad, uh, um, and we are going to talk about that when I, when I mention our interactions with some of the uh, multilateral organizations, uh, a broader effort to promote efficiency and in the quality of public expenditure, but also to improve regulation so that firms can, you know, you diminish the number of days that it takes to open a firm and actually um, diminish the number of days that you, can, that you need to close a firm. It's incredibly hard to close a firm in Brazil. So bankruptcy law is being looked at also by the government. I'm actually part of a working group that is looking at the ways to improve bankruptcy law in the country. So let's talk first about, I would say, uh, one venue that really occupies a lot of my time, that is the interaction of Brazil with the G20. So Brazil is an active G20 member with a strong voice in the discussion about the international economic and financial cooperation. I was just in Baden-Baden, and we are actively participating in the writing of the communique that you, you guys read. Um, was, uh, and uh, I, I, what I can say is that uh, the work in Brazil in that particular venue is in line with the latest financial sector regulation. And uh, we, are, we are really building a resilient and modern financial market in Brazil. It's a testimony for the strength of supervision in Brazil, how resilient Brazilian banks are to the worst recession in measured Brazilian history. So this recession that we are just coming out of it is worse than what we, we, we lived during the Great Depression, for instance. Uh, we are definitely aiming at greater integration to international trade flows. And like uh, the ambassador mentioned, uh, that's typified by the, the, the interview that Marcos Galvão, that is my counterpart, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, gave, we, in which we support 
uh, fully support. So we are taking actions to pursue inclusive growth. For us, it's not just a, a, a banner, but it's important. Um, uh, as we are going to see a couple of slides down below, inclusive growth and actually sustainable growth is really key for us, and our interactions with some of the multilateral organizations is really making sure that investment infrastructure is done in a way that is environmentally friendly. For us, is, 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 a, is a key objective. So anyway, so given all that, uh, we are big advocates of greater multilateralism and stronger international organizations. Um, at, at the, at the, uh, in the meetings of the G20. So the first big organization is one of the places I worked for many years, that is the IMF, and Brazil leads the constituency as key and is a key participant in the IMF agenda. Again, for us, development needs to be sustainable. New to, we are helping and, and thinking about new tools to detect and avoid systemic risks and crises. Uh, I'm not sure we, you, you guys will be up to discuss different IMF facilities, but we are beginning to rethink, we, I mean, the Brazilian office at the IMF, what's the best way to support those facilities, or at least have a position that is a position of leadership. We can talk about that. Um, so, of course, we are, we are working to promote global economic and financial stability. We are interested in a wider safety net than currently available, and capacity building certainly for Brazil, but for all the emerging markets is a, is a, is a key uh, aspect of what the IMF does. We are also very interested in pushing governance reform. We still see that the, the uh, emerging markets are underrepresented at the board. They should have a higher uh, share of the votes than, than we do. And uh, we are going to work for the 2000, and now 2019, should have been 2017, the quota reform is successful and also uh, um, the capacity of the MF to lend to countries in need, like the new initiatives like the uh, NAB and the note purchasing uh, agreements. With the World Bank, our insertion is much more, I would say, symbiotic in the sense that uh, not just we abide by the mission of the World Bank and we are very uh, involved in the decisions, in the multilateral decisions, but we are starting uh, a, a country partnership that is going to go to the board of the World Bank in 2017 that is completely integrated to our domestic agenda. And here is really we begin to talk about the, the, the main part of, of this talk. Um, the country partnership framework, the way we designed, and it was really designed in January when I, when I went there, was to support first budget consolidation and promote government effectiveness in public service in a sustainable, inclusive, and efficient manner. What I'm saying here is that we are moving away from the World Bank dealing directly with states and municipalities in Brazil. Um, it is a great um, evolution of a World Bank work, the fact that they do so, but that type of interaction doesn't work in a country that is facing big state debt problems. So many states in Brazil, as you know, are facing severe fiscal problems. So the way that we're designing our relationship with the World Bank pass through uh, some recentralization of that relationship where we define national priorities that are also relevant for the, at the state level. Is the federal government the borrow from the World Bank because the borrowing is important so that we can establish a relationship and they can provide services to us, which are very valuable because they are very good. And, uh, um, but uh, is the federal government that is in control of, of indebtedness and states and municipalities get a type of a grant once they reach a particular policy uh, threshold that is what was agreed with them. So that is important because a, a big part of Brazil cost of doing business is the fact that state and municipalities are not very efficient in um, managing licenses and, uh, and just to navigate tax system in, at the local level is very hard in particular for foreign investors. So we are starting a program with the uh, Internal Revenue, Brazilian Internal Revenue Service, taking the lead of modernization of that part of Brazilian uh, government. Then we have a second point here that you're saying, enable private sector investments, increase productivity, and more jobs. Here basically is a program that we are starting with some help of the Brazilian uh, Development Bank 
to create uh, infrastructure bonds. And the, the World Bank is, is quite active with, with us in thinking about financial ways to finance investment in a way that is not direct investment, because what these governments do is crowd in private investment, not crowd out private investment, but at the same time creates a financial instrument that facilitates uh, the, the availability of capital for firms that not necessarily have free access, say, to the U.S. capital markets. And uh, we have here moved our more equitable and sustainable development. That is because a part of this uh, program is, uh, um, is focused on green projects. So basically, uh, the green finance issue uh, is, is one issue that actually surprising, surprising to me. I didn't expect that. But it's part, a big part of my agenda as well. So I do receive um, institutions like the GSZ, the German uh, in, um, the institution that finance green investment in different parts of the world. We do deal with a lot of uh, 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 ONGs, NGOs, that you say in English, <laughs> NGOs. And uh, um, so the World Bank is also helping uh, thinking of programs that are um, pro-development, but at the same time protect the environment. Um, as I said before, we are one of the emerging market uh, countries that most has most contributed to the development mission of the bank, including by continual support of IDA um, in a year where we are doing a deep fiscal adjustment. So we did reduce our contribution to IDA. Uh, for those that don't know, it's a basic grant program to less developed nations. It's very important for us to continue, and we didn't cut, even though that goes what in the public finance jargon above the line basically uh, makes hard for us to deliver our primary uh, uh, objectives uh, in the fiscal accounts. One of the problems of the um, um, Bretton Woods institutions is that um, Brazil is graduating, basically, from the World Bank. Uh, it's getting harder for countries of the level of development of Brazil to get financing for things that are quite important to us, like infrastructure. Brazilian infrastructure is really... Um, is really uh, creating a big bottleneck. I mean, you, you've seen maybe a month ago the newspapers in the world showing Brazilian trucks really mired in mud, trying to send production of soy from the heart of the country. That is where soy production happens, to the ports. So we need better roads, and, uh, but there is some movement within the World Bank that w we are trying to, to stall a little bit to kind of... Uh, basically not lend to countries of the level of income of Brazil. And we started other ways to get finance for infrastructure. One of them that is, takes a lot of my time because I'm the chairman of the board of directors is the new development bank that some people call the BRICS Bank. That was an initiative of the previous government that we are taking um, on board and we are really moving ahead. Um, I think the advantage of this new development bank is that uh, we, we have the opportunity to create an institution that is lean, that does is not very large. For instance, the old bank has more than 10,000 10, employees. That has a very specific mission that is finance of infrastructure investment. And we are in the control of corporate governance together with the four other countries that are founding members of the bank. So this bank provides middle-income country, countries with an alternative source of funding, we have think of new and innovative financial instruments. We do operate in local currencies. So the idea is to basically issue bonds in local currencies. There was some bonds issued in Yuan a month ago, and the bank is lending in Yuan, um, and, uh, um, which was going to happen with, with the currency mismatch in the balance sheet of the bank. Um, the focus of the bank, again, is on sustainable infrastructure, and we are going to sign the first loan with Brazil at the end of the month with the presence of Brazilian president, Michel Temer. Um, and it's a, it's a program um, to finance wind power investment in Brazil with the support also of the BNDES. Because one difficulty of creating a new bank is really the staff needs to learn what it is to be a multilateral bank. So what we are doing, we are partnering with other institutions like the CAF, Fon Plata. You have been talking to the IDB as well and also have made uh, uh, strides in talking with the World Bank. So we have partnership, and then uh, the New Development Bank can help uh, this movement. We are also in the process of starting uh, to think about which new countries will be invited to join the bank. It's 
for Brazil in particular, is a very important part of this agenda, that this bank is an inclusive bank. We are less concerned about the history of its creating, creation and much more looking at the future and saying what would be better for a bank like that to be a bank that has more members, that would diversify the capital side of the bank and the lending side of the bank. We are in favor of adhering to the OECD. Uh, that's what Minister Meirelli said in the Baden-Baden meeting that we were there and is another big part of, of my job in the Brazilian government. Brazil has become a strong and active key partner of the OECD. The dialogue remains focused, forward-looking, and mutually beneficial. Uh, OECD officials do see with very great eyes the possibility of Brazil entering the institution. So we will build on our past international experience and best practice available internationally. In entering in the OECD, we enhance our voice and would help us going back to investment grade path. And we are very interested in the quality sea of governance. That, by the way, Brazil is already part of most of the good working groups at the OECD. Uh, of all the non-members, is the country that is more involved in OECD work. So we see very low cost for Brazil to enter there and just basically big benefits. So that's a process that we start. We are starting right now. The Ministry of Finance is taking the lead. Other ministries are in conversation with us. So we haven't applied yet, but it's a big uh, priority of this ministry to make that happen. Let's talk about trade now. Here, is, I'm not going to talk about as much with interactions and conversations with international organizations, and much more what we at the Ministry of Finance think should be the priority in this area. Brazil is the fourth most closed economy to international trade in the world. Trade to GDP ratio of about 27.4%, only ahead of Sudan, Nigeria, and our partners in Mercosul, Argentina. Th that's simply not good enough. Um, uh, that was basically based on a policy that is still uh, prioritized uh, mercantilistic vision that think that if you protect an economy, that would protect jobs and make the economy grow. And that vision is antiquated and doesn't apply to Brazil anymore. Um, for instance, the highest average applied import tariff among all emerging or developed economies in the world is in, is in Brazil. It's the sixth highest among all the 164 WTO members. We are the world leader in the application of anti-dumping measures, uh, if you look at the 2013 to the 2016 period. So for someone that's coming to Brazil after 26 years working abroad, it's, I see that as a scandal and something that we are going to work in, in the Brazilian Finance Ministry to change. Uh, it's not a government-wide position yet how to go about this. Uh, we are going to work on things like anti-dumping measures are decided in the context of a chamber that is composed by several ministries, and the Ministry of Finance is one of them. It's called CAMEX. Um, we, we, our role in that particular uh, collegiate is to discuss if a particular measure damages the Brazilian consumer or other parts of the Brazilian economy. In other words, the Brazilian Finance Minister is or should be the guardian of the interest of the average voter. And that's what we intend to do. So, and um, it, it may seem a small thing, but every single discussion on anti-dumping in that chamber is going to be um, scrutinized. There'll be memorandums from the Ministry of Finance to study if the application of this particular measure is damaging to the Brazilian economy, which is something that was simply not happening, at least not consistently. The consequence of such closeness is, is captured by this chart here, and that basically gives us full, we go back to the beginning of the, of the conversation, there's a problem of productivity growth in Brazil. The bl blue line shows average labor productivity growth in G20 countries, and the red line shows the Brazilian numbers. I mean, for a country that is stuck in these middle income uh, levels, you cannot have figures like that, like the red part. We want that line to be above the blue line. We need that line to be above the blue line um, for Brazil to catch up to uh, the, the level of income of more developed economies. And trade will be part of it. I think trade openness is a big, important part. So what lies ahead in the trade discussion? I think it's a good moment to discuss economic openness because of the political change both in Brazil and Argentina. 
I mean, I think this type of talk that I'm giving would be given, I'm sure, by my counterpart in the Argentina government, by what I heard from them. So there's a convergence of views that this block needs to be more open. And the Ministry of Finance and some other government agencies are working on a pro-productive agenda that includes economic openness. One is trade policy reforms. The big issue here is how to um, integrate those uh, with the third point here, that is what I say, a more decisive push to conclude important trade negotiations. There is always this tension between how much a government does outside trade negotiations and how much it does within trade negotiations. Our position is that we need to do both at the same time. Rethinking tariff uh, in the context of Mercosur, including uh, in the middle of important negotiations as the one that we are doing now with the European Union. What we cannot have we have a rhetoric of 20 years of saying that we are going to open the Brazilian economy when trade negotiations um, are concluded and basically have 20 years of no relevant trade negotiations being concluded. Um, we also, like I mentioned before, have a strict approach to imposing anti-dumping measures. So all these are policy intentions. We don't have any measure to announce today, and I doubt we're going to have any time soon. This is hard day-to-day -day work convincing other parts of government that that agenda should be at the top of the list. Again, I'm just speaking here for the Ministry of Finance. The result of this movement of reform and, and particular uh, focus on good macroeconomic governance is what you see in this chart. After CDS spreads going up to the roof, to levels that we've seen before just during the great financial crisis of 2008, CDS spreads are coming down in Brazil, and our expectation is they're going to continue to come down because the government is going to continue with its reform agenda. I would say almost, and we can talk about that in the mm -hmm. Q&A, independently of what's happening in the political side, one thing that is a great asset of this government is the ability of the president to negotiate with Congress. He's an extremely able uh, person. And, uh, we are, and is committed to a reform agenda, and we are committed to help him on the technical side, on the political side, to make that happen. So I think the message, that's my last slide, is that, like one of my preferred Nobel Prize winners said, the times, they are changing. I, I don't say this with sarcasm. I think, I think Bob Dylan is a genius. And um, in times of, at times of crisis are times of reforms, like the ambassador mentioned before. A crisis is an awful thing to waste. And, and we, are, we are right, I think, in this historic moment in Brazil in an in a enviable position. And that's why I accepted the offer to join the government. <coughs> it's a tough road ahead, but I think it's going to be made much easier by international cooperation. And that's what we are going to be doing this week here in Washington during the spring meetings of the IMF. Brazil continues committed to multilateralism, which is an evolving concept. And uh, uh, I think that's important to say. I think there are too many actors in the world saying bad things about multilateralism. And we are active in helping to shape the concept, again, including this week. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think Teresa wanted to speak first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the Wilson Center for uh, the opportunity to comment on this very interesting, really thought-provoking presentation. Thank you, Marcello. Mm -hmm. Marcello and I, by the way, go back quite a way, having been colleagues in, uh, in the IMF, and I've seen uh, uh, him in, in various capacities, and I'm very happy that he has decided to return to Brazil, uh, and uh, the IMF loss is definitely Brazil's uh, uh, again, and at a very important uh, time uh, where, uh, you know, the country is now indicating a, a real commitment to uh, opening up. Um, those of you who follow Brazil for a long time will, not, will have noticed how different this talk is from what would have been uh, uh, given by a Brazilian <laughs> official uh, um, just a couple of years ago. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Marcello's main message, uh, that is to say that the agenda of domestic structural reform of the current uh, government in Brazil needs to be accompanied, complemented, by continued and I would say strengthened efforts to promote the country's integration into the global economy, 
and to support more strongly multila multilateralism. Uh, the IMF has recently published uh, the World Economic Outlook, and in one of the analytical chapter, uh, it, has, it includes a empirical analysis conducted on a large uh, database of emerging market and developing countries that shows that increased trade and financial openness have been positively correlated with growth acceleration in uh, these countries in recent uh, decades. So. Uh, an openness agenda is also a growth agenda. The analysis also highlights that uh, the positive effects of favorable external conditions on growth are enhanced, uh, magnified by sound domestic macroeconomic policies and institution, and that such policies and institution, in particular low debt, exchange rate flexibility, and trade openness, help moderate the impact of external shocks on growth. And we all know that uh, Brazil, like uh, everybody else in the <laughs> global economy these days is uh, quite susceptible to external shocks. Marcello's presentation has uh, summarized uh, quite well the main components of the Brazilian government's domestic reform agenda, in particular the social security, the tax, public administration, and labor reforms. I would add to this uh, the important, perhaps less publicized, effort uh, that is being that has been made and continues to be made to improve the performance of the main financial and non-financial federal enterprises, including such uh, regional giants as BNDES, Banco do Brasil, Petrobras, and Eletrobras, and to improve uh, also the domestic regulatory environment for infrastructure investment, an important precondition for uh, uh, an acceleration of such investments. The government has also been trying to diffuse <laughs> the time bomb of the financial crisis in major states and uh, municipalities, and has been trying to do so without uh, raising the moral hazard, or say, trying to mitigate at the same time the moral hazard that, that, that is uh, inherent in, uh, in such uh, bailouts. And uh, having witnessed the previous uh, uh, episodes of this, uh, of this saga, I really wish him well in this uh, difficult uh, enterprise. Of course, uh, as uh, any observer of Brazil developments knows, uh, um, the well-demonstrated commitment of the current economic team uh, to this reform agenda has been, uh, I would say, buffeted in recent months by the fast-moving developments in the uh, in investigations of corruption schemes, particularly the Lava Jato which have weakened <coughs> the political room for maneuver of the government. Time will tell to what extent the government will uh, be able to carry out the proposed reforms during the uh, remaining 18 months or so of its term in office. But I believe uh, that uh, this is, even if not all of the agenda, which is a very ambitious agenda, uh, can be carried out uh, within uh, this, uh, the time span of this government, uh, the, the efforts that are being made will pay off uh, uh, in the medium term because they, have, they are helping to change the attitude of the, uh, the Brazilian public and uh, uh, Brazilian society is starting to hear from after 10 years of a, of a sort of interventionist and uh, uh, I would say message, uh, now a message of openness, of uh, market-based uh, uh, economy with, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, inclusive uh, attention to uh, social inclusion and environmental sustainability, as uh, uh, Marcello has mentioned. As Marcello emphasized in his presentation, increasing trade integration is and should remain an important part of the government's reform agenda. And this means uh, not only reducing the import tariffs, which remain too high on average, but also less visible non-tariff uh, trade uh, um, barriers, and Monica will talk quite a lot about that, including the excessive use of uh, anti-dumping actions that has been mentioned by Marcello. And at the same time, to continue uh, efforts to facilitate trade, uh, to reduce transport and logistics costs, and to pursue um, trade-friendly tax policies. 
A, a successful pursuit of this agenda will certainly have important payoffs in terms of increasing productivity, which has been lagging beyond the G20 average, as Marcelo said, and facilitating Brazil's insertion in the global value chains and helping ensure a continued flow of uh, um, FP FPI. Of course, uh, many in Brazil and abroad are likely to ask whether it makes sense uh, for a large global player like Brazil to increase openness at a time when some other major players are threatening to restrict the trade. My view, and I'm sure this is a very broadly shared view, is that Brazil is the only country that can effectively lead a process of greater regional integration in Latin America, which would be an appropriate response to possible protectionist trends in the US, and perhaps, uh, although hopefully not, in Europe, we'll see the results of the French election. <coughs> in its latest macro report, the IDB has highlighted a number of steps, uh, which they call low-hanging fruits, that could be taken uh, to promote this uh, um, greater regional integration, such as making rules of origin more uniform across the region, and the filling missing pieces, such as uh, the Brazil-Mexico -Me trade treaty that uh, um, uh, Marcelo has alluded to, in uh, the existing mosaic of bilateral trade treaties, wi treaties within the region, with a view to eventually moving towards a Latin America free trade area. Brazil can also, I mean, regional integration is important, but it's also important to, to uh, deepen trade ties with advanced countries that remain committed to free trade with other emerging markets and uh, with uh, uh, the dynamic uh, low-income economies. Brazil can also uh, act within the various multilateral trade and financial fora in which it has an important voice to promote global integration rather than being a restraining force as was the case under the previous government. And both Brazil and the global economy would benefit from uh, a vigorous pursuit of such a stance and I wish them well in this respect. Thank you. Monica? Thank you. Thank you um, once again to, to, to the Wilson Center and to the Brazil Institute for inviting me to speak. I feel like I'm here practically every week these days. Um, thank you, Marcelo, for your very, very nice and comprehensive um, presentation. Thanks, Teresa, for your, for your comments, some, some of which I will echo and, and build upon. Um, let me start by by saying that, um, well, uh, I'm basically gonna, be, gonna center my comments on three major points. Um, the first being about openness in general. The second, more specifically on how to move beyond tariffs um, into the idea of reducing these trade barriers in Brazil. And thirdly, on reforms, and specifically on financial sector reform and how this could help trade. Um, starting with openness, I, both, both Marcelo and Teresa highlighted the importance of trade openness for product, pr enhancing productivity and enhancing growth. Um, I would add to that a third factor. I mean, we have seen for years now, well, months, um, practically years, um, the, the facts on the ground in Brazil, the corruption probe, the things that have been revealed. Um, all of this is also a reflection of, of, of being closed. So being open and opening up the economy is a way also to move forward um, in dealing with corruption and in dealing with all of these issues that have plagued Brazil for a very long time. So I'd like to add that as a, as, as a, as a point of adv advocacy for, for greater openness. On the question of, of openness itself and moving beyond tariffs, um, while true that Brazil has still extremely high average tariff rates, there are, as Teresa mentioned, a number of areas where Brazil has actually not made a lot of progress on and in fact has actually regressed. Um, specifically, in, in a report that was done in 2014 by the Peterson Institute documenting the countries that had institute that, that had adopted local content requirements, which is a very opaque um, and very hard to um, measure um, barrier to trade. Um, Brazil was amongst, well, it was actually the top country um, which had, after the financial crisis, adopted such 
measures. Um, these measures have very <coughs> severe consequences for the economy. They do hamper productivity. As I said, they're very hard to measure. They don't exactly emulate tariffs. They create a number of distortions in the economy. They certainly don't help productivity. Um, and therefore, one of the things that I believe um, this government is probably very concerned about, and, and, and it should well be, is removing, as it has already started to do in the oil and gas sector, but more broadly removing these local content requirements because they are a very serious impediment to trade. Um, in addition to that, and looking beyond um, the, the, the sorts of things that countries normally talk about when they talk about greater trade integration, there are a number of areas that, as we know, have been under discussion for a while um, in, the, in the realm of other trade agreements, some of which currently no longer are moving forward, like TPP, but things like um, looking into intellectual property rights, looking into regulatory convergence, looking into customs procedures, which in Brazil are terribly difficult, um, and w where there, ha there has also been some progress um, in the last few years, but mo more progress needs to be done in order to advance um, on this process of not just trade integration, but even moving a step below that, trade facilitation, which is, which is an agenda that really does need to be, be, to be picked up. Um, regulatory convergence, especially regulatory convergence within the region, especially in the context of um, if we're thinking about integration between the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur, a lot needs to be done going beyond just the harmonization of rules of origin, but a lot of other things in the area of regulatory convergence where Pacific Alliance countries seem to be um, much at a, a step further, mu many steps further, um, have moved many steps further than Brazil or Argentina or, or um, Uruguay and Paraguay. So that's another area, I, I believe, where um, things would need to move forward. It's a very ambitious agenda, it takes a long time, but it's very reassuring to see that this is a key concern of the current government and that this is, this is an area where um, the government is looking to make progress on. Um, my third point, which is on financial sector reform more broadly, there is a lot of research um, that looks into the relationship between financial development and trade. And notably, um, both the theoretical work and the empirical work in this area shows that the more financially developed a country, the better prospect it has for trade, and in particular for building up these big sort of export powerhouses, companies, um, and, and the like. And one thing that is striking about Brazil is that despite the fact that it is such a large country with, su with, with such massive potential, it isn't a country that when you compare it to, say, China or to India or to other big emerging markets, it doesn't have a lot of these export powerhouses to show for it. Um, yes, everybody knows of Embraer. Yes, everybody knows of other companies. But it, it is seriously lagging behind um, a, a number of other big emerging markets in that respect. And I think that has, of course, a lot to do with the, the overall climate in Brazil with respect to trade openness and the focus up to now that has been the, the hallmark of previous governments, the focus on the local market ra rather than on the external market. But I think credit market segmentation, which is a massive problem in Brazil where you have these huge spreads um, between lending and borrowing rates and not just that, you have a segment of the market that is very much earmarked and another, another segment of the market which is not, contributes to a situation where this doesn't really happen, where companies, um, even smaller companies that cr could grow into big export powerhouses simply don't have the ability to do so because of some kind of lack of access to financing um, related to this type of credit market segmentation. The current government is doing a lot on, and Teresa mentioned this with respect to BNDS, but there are a lot of initiatives on financial sector reform going on right now. Many of them don't get the, the attention that they should because they, they end up being um, sort of obfuscated by social security reform and all of the other more difficult reforms that the country is adopting. 
But it should be highlighted and it should be underscored that this is an area that is that is moving along very well. And it should continue to do so because if Brazil has any hope of ever becoming the rising to its potential um, and not being a laggard, as, as Marcelo will show in the openness indicators, it does need to have, you know, a kind of a mindset that is um, more sort of focused on creating these kinds of export powerhouses as other countries have done. So that's pretty much my third remark. Let me just add one thing. Um, I was very happy in, in, in to hear that the government currently has, the Brazilian government currently has this um, openness agenda and is looking to incorporate other parts of the government which may not yet be on board with this kind of reform agenda. I do want to emphasize, however, that we need to have the private sector on board too. And it's been notoriously hard um, in Brazil to sell to the private sector that trade is good for them. Um, the private sector in Brazil has had a tendency to think sort of 1950s, 1960s style that it's all about the local market, it's not about the international market. And I think that mindset needs to change in order for these, um, for this progress and for these advances to, ha to happen. So with that, I'll end my, my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And I'd like to open the floor up to questions. If you could just please state your name and affiliation. Juliano, <laughs> if you could just wait until we have the mic come over to you. Um, that way the people watching online can hear as well. Good morning, uh, Marcelo. I was hearing your presentation. And well, we are here uh, during the spring meetings. And I'd like to know what should be uh, the goals for Brazil uh, during the meetings. What do we want to, to reach here in Washington during this week? What we, I assume, this is my first time as government official <laughs> part of the meetings, but what we, every, every spring and annual meetings we should do, uh, participate actively in the debate. We don't have a Brazil agenda here. <coughs> we are here as members of the international community, and we are here to debate things like uh, the role of multilateralism, the importance of trade to growth. We are here to debate the, the research of the IMF, the research of the World Bank, the directions that these two institutions should take. Um, basically, that, that's what it is. I mean, I'm talking about Brazil now, and of course, uh, there'll be like, for instance, the G20 deputies meeting that I participated, there'll be a G20 ministers meeting that I also participate, but it's the <laughs> minister Meirelles that, that speak. Uh, and we are going to talk a little bit about the Brazilian economy, but that's like five minutes. It's not like we are here to participate in the, uh, the way I see it, this is a big exercise of governance for those institutions, and we are a big part of it. We are going to meet the countries in our constituencies, both the IMF and the World Bank, and listen, and listen to them, hear what, they, what their complaints are. The constituency is a bit mixed. We have very small countries that may be hurt by the issues of the risking of banks, uh, countries that may be uh, are facing um, doubts about what's going to happen to the money that the immigrants send to their homes. Um, so we are going to be discussing how Brazil is here to better defend their interests in these institutions. Next question. Uh, Claudio Trevisan from the Brazilian newspaper Estado de São Paulo. I'd like, to, could you elaborate a little bit on the anti-dumping uh, question? You said that it's a scandal that Brazil is the number one using anti-dumping measures. And what is the goal of the government and, and why it's a scandal? And also, this World Bank recentralization is something that is in progress or is something that it has already done, has already been made? And if you can, is there an estimative? What is the impact? How many states, uh, or, or how much of the amount of finance that was cut because of this recentralization? Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you asked the questions because certainly on the second point you, you misunderstood what I meant. Um, the the money I was just talking about the World Bank program, 
and the money is going to continue flowing to the to the states. We are just shielding them from having to borrow. So basically, these are going to be grants from the federal government to them, gifts if they do the policy that was decided um, in a program with the World Bank. So that those transfers are not going to be implying um, the need to repay the money that is being transferred to them. That's just in the context of the World Bank, which is small, quote unquote, small potatoes when it comes to the budget of this. Uh, we are talking about, I don't know, between $500 million and a billion, if the program passes in the World Bank. So it's less of a big deal than, than what you think. We are just saying that one big problem often to interact with international organizations is that they may have direct relationships with municipalities and, and states. They have real needs, but not necessarily the ability to repay the debt, and they end up being in trouble. So we are doing that exactly to support states and municipalities, not to curtail the access to resources. We are doing that because without doing that, they wouldn't be able to participate in those programs because they simply don't have the capacity, the fiscal capacity, to absorb that. So that's the idea. And the question was how to make that happen. The way that we found is um, having very uh, well-designed policies at the central level that are going to be three, five years to take place related to uh, ways to modernize the, the tax system in Brazil. And, and you know, states and municipalities are big parts of that, so they need to be part of it. So that, that was the context of what I said. What was your first question? I was okay, the anti-dumping. Yeah, I wouldn't use this candle in the, in the state of, uh, in your newspaper, um, because wha wha I just, I, I meant to say that exactly to, to ca okay, <laughs> it's okay, well, you can say, just to catch your attention, because what I meant is why we need to do so much anti-dumping measures in Brazil? Why, why so special about Brazil? I mean, wh why the Brazilian economy needs so much what, what Monica said, non-tariff barriers. I, I, don't, I don't see the reason. I mean, I, the reason is this, uh, I don't even understand as an economist the reason. I, I'm serious, I'm not joking. I don't understand the argument that says if, if I make sure that this economy doesn't see foreign products, I'm protecting jobs. I don't understand the argument. I, I don't understand. I mean, a, a country that exports a lot is a country that imports a lot. A country that grows a lot is a country that can borrow at low cost to be able to finance its production. So a country that grows a lot is a country that doesn't have barriers to how companies can decide how to fund the operations. So the local content that Monica was talking about. So if, if think about your family, it's like someone telling you, you have to do things, but just in this very specific way, and I know best because I'm the government, so that doesn't make much sense to me. So I, I, I actually don't even understand the, the argument. Literally, I don't understand. The argument is, um, is maybe part of some world where there is limited resources, there is no technological growth, no technological transfer, and then there is we always produce 100 in e e each year, and countries are fighting to see who produces these 100. This is like, this is not the world we live in. So that's basically what I meant. I, I, I simply do not understand the policy, so I cannot support it. It's just, again, it's nothing revolutionary. It's something that makes your readers yawn. What we are doing is basically we sit in, the, in this college that decide, you know, called CAMEX, that decides trade policy issues. The role of the Ministry of Finance is to look at every proposal for anti-dumping measure and say, does this make sense for the Brazilian economy? And what I'm saying is that we are taking this role very seriously. So are you going to review? I'm going to review everything. I'm one vote. There is seven ministries. I may lose all of the votes but we're going to review very seriously every single request for anti-dumping because it's serious stuff. I mean, it's, it's, we are talking about um, sometimes protecting a particular sector of producers at the expense of the whole population. So I if you talk about an input that goes in everybody's shoes, or like rubber or, or you know, anyway. So it, it's very serious stuff that is decided 
I think in a way that I don't think should be decided, should, be, should have more analysis. It's more work for us. And it doesn't mean that we are going to see the effects of this change in behavior tomorrow. It just means that this is serious stuff. I'm not, we are not going to be voting just because everybody is voting in favor of those policies. Monica? Yeah, I just wanted to add two points to Marcelo's very, very um, cogent comments on these issues. Um, Non-tariff barriers is something that, as Marcelo said, makes people yawn, but it really shouldn't because it's stuff that does affect people's lives directly. So when we're, when, when we're thinking about anti-dumping measures and doing a, a profound review of anti-dumping measures in the way that Marcelo was just describing, or when we're thinking of scaling back local content requirements, or when we're thinking of you know scaling back any other type of non-tariff barrier or you know technical barrier to trade, um, what we're talking about here is something that has not only you know impact on productivity, growth, and so on and so forth, but it has an impact on the cost of living. So these measures actually add to a product's cost you know, when, when, when you have them imposed. Um, local content requirements do this for cars and for a range of other products. They're much more expensive in Brazil for that reason as well as others. Um, and other non-tariff um, or technical barriers to trade do the same. So I can't stress enough how important uh, 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 an initiative such as this is for Brazil. And Brazil has a lot of capacity to do this through COMEX. COMEX has been doing incredible work um, in a lot of different studies on how these barriers have affected the Brazilian economy. A lot more of this work needs to be done. But I, as I said, um, I think for the way to to make to, to to really bring the message to readers in Brazil and to get people thinking about these issues is to make them understand that their cost of living is that much higher because these measures are in place. So there needs to be a serious conversation about this. Thank you. Next question. Yes, sir. Peter Hakem from the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, Marcelo, thanks for a great uh, introduction. Uh, you know, I agree with almost everything you and the other panelists recommend Brazil doing. But I must admit, you can see from my gray hair, I've been watching this for years. And every one of the items that you've discussed, maybe dumping is a little original. I hadn't quite gotten on. Uh, uh, have been advocated <coughs> various points by finance ministers, planning ministers, even occasionally foreign ministers. And uh, the absence has always been there's no political support in Brazil for an opening. Uh, Brazil is not a big exporter in terms, and yeah, in terms of the world's countries, but in terms of per capita basis, it's very, very low. And Monica mentioned the, even the business community uh, is at best divided on these measures, let alone. Uh, so, you know, uh, I look at uh, our own politics these days and I said, well, where's the weight that's going to sort of stand behind this? Uh, you know, I would have felt better if, for example, the trade office had been taken out of Itamaraty and put back into. Uh, trade and, and, and ministerial uh, uh, industrial development, or it's set up a separate, but it's in a very big bureaucracy. And, you know, how much can we really accomplish before the next election uh, gets everybody's politics invested in it? And just a small other question, I'm sure you'll consider it small, is uh, where is Brazil on Mercosur, where is Mercosur, has any progress been made in, in to sort of make this a little more functional? <coughs> Thank you. On your question on is this just pie in the sky, basically, that's what you're saying. I mean, um, it, uh, my answer is it doesn't matter to me. It's not going to change the way I think and the way I behave. I mean, like, I, 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 I 
I, I'm not going to do the things in, in the wrong way because that's the feasible way. So I mean, I'm, believe me, I'm not very well paid in government. I'm not there for the money. So it's like uh, my family lives here in Arlington, Virginia. So there's a personal cost for me to be there. So I mean, so if if I wouldn't have accepted if I couldn't try to do a little bit on that. So you try to do a lot. If you accomplish a little bit, it's a big victory. And that's how I am. So again, I, I can change the way I behave. And I can discuss serious economic policy with people in government. And, uh, and to change the behavior of the Ministry of Finance in the context of ECAMEX is completely under my purview. So I can do that. I mean, it's, I just do it. The Minister Meirelli supports 100% this view and this action and uh, is, a, is a ministerial policy. So that's my answer. I mean, we are going to continue working and. Uh, I haven't. Been, I have been working so much in the background because I. That's how I like to do. I like to get things done, uh, and um, that I haven't spent that much time doing things that I'm doing now. But I will do that and talk to different segments of society, including the industrial uh, organizations like FIESP, the the associations like ABIMAC, and all, all this. We. Are, I'm going to meet all of them, and. Um, and try to have, uh, I agree with Monica, it's a bit bizarre why we need to convince people because it's so obvious. I mean, you can say, oh, but the current car makers, they are sitting there, they benefit from the, yes, but there's a bunch of other people in, the, in Brazil, not just the car makers. I mean, like, so um, we, we do need to bring this private sector uh, on board with this type of, of vision. By the way, I don't think Brazil has any way out of just simply changing. See what's happened at the WTO. Simply, we cannot continue with the policies we had because they are illegal. So we cannot do it. So we have to find other options. And the option is to modernize our relationships with the rest of the world, is to rethink trade policy, is not to use trade negotiations as, as a cop-out for not doing anything. Um, that's what we need to do. I mean, I, I mean, we have no option, simply. I mean, several of these programs are being contested at the WTO, and we are going to lose it. We already lost. We are, we are like, uh, appealing, but we are going to lose it, several of these protection programs, like we should lose. So um, we need options. Thank you. Well, Mercosul is part of this discussion, completely part of this discussion. I think the Argentinians agree with me The Mercosul hasn't worked out the way we all would like it to work out. Um, I think um, it is this uh, idea of uh, expanding to South America makes a lot of sense. I mean, everybody talks about that. It's not that original in that sense, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it's important. It's important. I mean, uh, we, we have a lot to learn from the Pacific Alliance. I think um, Peru, for instance, a case in point, in, since 2011, Peru has closed more than 20 trade agreements. I mean, this is unbelievable. Brazil hasn't closed 20 trade agreements in the, its history. Okay. I mean, so, so I mean, like, uh, it's not even close. And, uh, and you see the results. You see countries like Colombia, Chile, um, Peru, was severely hit by the declining commodity prices. These are economies, they're much more dependent on commodity prices than Brazil. And they wrote it. I mean, what happened to Colombia is, um, is unbelievable. The main export uh, commodity has its price cut by four in a period of two months. And uh, I, it was not a great, almost great depression-like recession in Colombia. Peru wrote it, this whole thing, mm -hmm. beautifully. You know, and now some people forecast Peru to grow between three and four percent this year. I mean, Chile, oh, it's growing very little. It's growing two percent. Uh, Brazil is growing minus, almost minus four percent. So I mean, it's it's the difference is starting, and I think we should really take to heart. I think the difference is the economies are much more integrated to the world economy. They suffer from that, but they are more flexible. They have the ability to to withstand that. Um, Brazil didn't do even even worse than it did because it had a lot of reserves. Didn't have a balance of payment crisis, and, and and that's nice. And, uh, and with the current macroeconomic policy, that's not even in the scenario of anybody because you have a responsible central bank and you have a fiscal authority that is trying to do uh, reforms. So that, again, you put that in the context of Mercosul, 
is basically what Argentina should be doing as well. And uh, so we are all rethinking. Uh, but then I also need to be careful because then you're basically getting out of my area, not just of expertise, of, of mandate. Mm -hmm. I'm not a trade negotiator. That's a, co a, a, a question for people from Itamaraty that are working hard on trying to close trade negotiations with the European Union. They have been ongoing for, what, 20 years? So uh, we, need, we need to close that. We, we need to finalize those negotiations. I wonder, just following up on that, I know you said you're not a trade negotiator, but what do you see as the prospects for dialogue between Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance or Mexico? I think the prospects are great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I th I, uh, from our side, we are looking to getting close to that, to those, both those uh, partners. Um, I, I can see interest from that side as well. We already have a lot of cooperation. We just closed a, a, a service agreement with uh, Peru. Mm -hmm. It's the first one um, in, in a while. And uh, that in, in, in also involves procurement of government uh, purchases. So um, I would say that this is happening. W what Teresa mentioned is happening. The question is that we, we want it to really continue happening and going to whatever extreme, in the good sense of the word extreme, that it can go. Um, again, it's not really my day-to-day -day job to, to negotiate, so I cannot talk about the details of it. But it's certainly um, something that uh, our Ministry of Foreign Relations take very seriously. That is our relationship with our partners in, in Latin America as a whole. Thank you. Next question, I think we have over here. <coughs> <coughs> Hi, um, my name is Marcela from PricewaterhouseCoopers and also from Brazil. Um, so first of all, I, I like this agenda much better than I liked previous ones. There's one thing that caught my attention is that we are um, seeking to join or get closer to the OECD because I know we've historically had this debate and it's something that we have uh, <coughs> deliberately decided not to do in the past. Um, why, why, well, I know there's a whole agenda towards openness, but the idea was that it would um, change our ability to be a natural leader in the development world or something like that. Um, how, why, why are we deciding to do that now? I think the answer is I don't understand that, that position before. So when you see something that is being doing, that's being done wrongly, you just change it. So I don't understand being a leader of developed eco of underdeveloped economies by um, giving up being developed, basically, or giving up participating in forums that will help you to do better. Um, so participate in a forum truly, not just as part of a working group, <coughs> that is really looking at improving corporate governance around the world. I agree with, with, uh, with Monica. I don't think we would have, you know, uh, fallen in the murky depths of misery <laughs> with <laughs> with this crisis if you're part of the OECD, basically because, I mean, you have to abide by by uh, uh, um, a certain level of rules of governance that I don't think we would be able to fall so, so low. Uh, I, I, mean, I may be wrong, maybe, maybe it's not such a big deal, but Brazil can enter. I think the OECD welcomes Brazilian entrance. We are studying what it takes to enter because you have to do reforms and many things that we may not want to do in our very first uh, uh, moment. So we are beginning the process of looking to it. But the government seriously is a serious, um, uh, seriously thinking about it and, uh, and, and working towards it. It's not just talk. Um, so that's the answer. I just don't understand. If you go to the worst parts of Brazil and you ask people, they are very poor, do you want to work, do you want to drive an uh, old Fusca, you know, a Volkswagen Beetle that is from 1906, or a Rolls Royce? I think the answer would be very clear. I mean, we all want Brazil to succeed, to do well, to be part of, the, of all the international organizations that would be helpful. And the OECD is one of them. Not being part of it, you're just shortchanging the country. Next question. <laughs> um, 
So in, in speaking about openness, a lot of um, openness and, and um, some other non-tariff barriers are cultural issues as well in terms of, let's say you have a, uh, a customs agent at the border, and if he sees his job as prohibiting the entry of goods unless the maximum uh, import is charged on each of those goods versus seeing his job as facilitating the entry of goods and charging the appropriate tariff if necessary. Um, that seems like a distinction without a difference, but in fact, uh, that kind of mental change um, also, I think, would, would add quite a bit to the openness of the country. Are there any internal uh, programs and re-education programs, for lack of a better term, in terms of changing the mentality uh, in, in particular ministries for the, this openness project? Could you mention your name <laughs> and affiliation? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. My name is Brian Short, Montgomery Fazone, a law firm. Okay. Uh, not that I know of. I think you're putting a lot of um, idealism in the mind of the, of the custom officers. I mean, I, I think, I, I don't know if they think the, the way you, you just described. I simply don't know. I don't think there's any program dis you know, described the way you did. I think the way to do it is to have an open debate about the goods and evils. There is some evil of getting more open. You're more susceptible to import crises from elsewhere. Again, it's a bit funny that I'm saying this because the country in Latin America that had the worst, well, let's forget Venezuela, but uh, the worst crisis um, uh, in the last couple of years is Brazil, which is one of the most closed of the economies because it was really driven by domestic uh, um, a, a domestic process that was unsustainable. Thus, why I think it's important to participate in the OECD and all, so that domestic, these domestic processes are harder to defend because you have to defend them in an international forum, which is about corporate governance, much more than the IMF, the World Bank, and then it's really what they do. I mean, they are involved in every single part of society. So I think it's important. But I, I think, so the answer is we need to keep having this conversation. And, um, again, about the goods and the evils of opening up more the economy. I think the goods are way, way outweigh the evils. Um, but I don't know if, I don't know if having a re-education program would work or even if it's needed. Good morning, Cassia Carvalho. I'm the executive director of the Brazil-US Business Council based here in Washington, DC. So Marcel, I first wanna begin by uh, commending um, the ministry and the Brazilian government for its reform agenda. It's a very ambitious agenda, but very much a necessary agenda with these uh, structural reforms that you are working on. Um, but these are no ordinary times, right, in Brazil. And under normal conditions, it would be very tough to get all of those things done in practically a year, right? Because then we have a political season next year. Um, and there are no ordinary times because we continue to have ongoing investigations and, you know, key figures in the government now being implicated. So um, my question is this, um, realistically, how much do you expect uh, to get done? How much can be done? I mean, we're talking about fiscal, labor, tax, pension. These are huge reforms, right? And I still think trade should be the fifth uh, reform on that agenda. But how much realistically does this government expect to get done? Okay, there's a simple all of it. I think it's very realistic. Uh, we are right now negotiating social security reform. It's not, probably it's not going to be exactly the same we proposed uh, as you read in the newspaper. But a reform will pass, and right after that, the labor reform will be voted. And then we are going to continue sending to Congress reform proposals. Um, I think trade should be the first one. I think it's the biggest problem. In it's what really makes Brazil most different from other countries They are doing well. I mean, um, labor laws, yes, need to be changed in Brazil, but look at labor laws in Europe. I spent years studying the European labor market, and it's very, it's very, um, um, it's very non-competitive, let me put this this way. And, uh, and, uh, um, and, you know, they are doing okay. Maybe they can afford because they, they have been rich for a while, but uh, nobody would want uh, <coughs> an underdeveloped country 
be born with Euro Italian institutions in, in, in some areas, or to some French labor market uh, rules. So, um, but anyway, but uh, um, so I would say what's really remarkable about Brazil is its closeness, I think. So in that sense, uh, I think should be a priority. Um, but I think we can do all. Uh, I see it happening. We pass, we pass the, um, we pass the ceiling, the fiscal ceiling. People thought we thought it would take forever, and it, it didn't. That's the minister calling, uh, <laughs> and uh, and it didn't. So uh, um, it was done fast. Social security reform again is being discussed right now. The labor reform is already in Congress. Uh, the other changes that I, I mentioned are being discussed right now. So, I mean, part of what I discussed in trade is depends just on the Ministry of Finance to do a bit more. And again, doesn't mean we're going to change reality tremendously, but we can at least change what we can change. Um, so, uh, uh, and again, I think the moment of crisis when these things happen. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Gene Smith with Smith Brandon International here in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's been a lot of comment, of course, about the closed economy. And there's no way to not recognize the situation with all the ongoing investigations, which is such a, a prolonged process. There's been a little bit of a comment about closed society and the issue of corruption. Is there any direct comment from each of you that spoke about does the closed economy kind of result in I'm doing it, he's doing it, she's doing it, we're all doing it. Does something about a closed trade environment, a, tr a closed political environment actually virtually encourage that and does this mean it's going to lead to more openness. And I'd like comments from each of you. I'd appreciate it. Well, I, I didn't say that. I don't know if uh, a study is showing that uh, in academics. So, so I don't know. I do think that, again, that I said, and I do believe that if Brazil were a member of the OECD, it would be harder for some things to happen. Um, Brazil, I don't think is a, it's purely my opinion, but I don't think it's an outlier in Latin America in terms of corruption or things like that. It's just a country is going about fighting it. And that's a great thing. I think uh, Teresa mentioned that, and I think she's right. It's a great thing for the long term. It's a great thing for the medium term. It hurts in the short term, because some of the people involved are big entrepreneurs that build bridges and houses and things like that. So it hurts GDP in the very short term. But it's, it's a great movement of Brazilian society, and uh, it's something that we support fully, of course. Um, but um, so I do think maybe uh, not being a part of some internet institutions may have at the margin contribute to some type of behavior. But I have to be careful here as well because Brazil does participate in a bunch of, you know, we are members of the World Bank, of the IMF, the IDB. We, we are very, we participate in a bunch of the working groups at OECD. OECD. So uh, the answer is I, I don't know if there is a link. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think there there is some incipient research on this aspect of linkages between corruption and trade. What I'd say with respect to Brazil is that it's a it it's very much a mindset issue. So once you have a closed type of economy, once you've put in place a number of measures, and this is going beyond the governance aspects that Marcelo was discussing. But once you've put in place measures like local content requirements, which are hugely opaque, um, it leads to a kind of obscurity within the economy that sort of lays the groundwork for certain things to happen. Now, as Marcelo was saying, you know, corruption is not unique to Brazil. What is unique to Brazil these days is that Brazil is investigating it and bringing everything to light. Um, and in that sense, you know, given that we are, we are, we, 
the country is having this movement towards transparency. It makes complete sense that this movement towards transparency be accompanied by a movement towards greater openness and less opaqueness. So within that overall context, it makes complete sense to have this kind of agenda. So I would answer your question in saying I think it will help. Um, whether it will be, whether openness is what will do it for Brazil in terms of eliminating corruption, I think may be going too far. Um, it hasn't done so for Mexico, which is a very open economy. Um, it hasn't done so for other countries in Latin America, but it's, it's certainly helpful. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I would agree entirely with what uh, Monica said. In fact, there are some studies, I think even the IMF, that show some correlation between uh, you know, the degree of corruption, lack of transparency, and uh, openness, not just trade openness, but also financial uh, uh, and uh, openness mo and, and transparency more generally. Uh, I also agree with Monica that, uh, you know, it's not going to be a panacea. I mean, the, you know, corruption in Brazil has uh, uh, long roots. It, it partly has also roots in the problem of, you know, not having good campaign financing and party financing uh, uh, mechanism. I think uh, those uh, also need to be changed. Those uh, in turn are linked with the issue of the political reform uh, because you, know, you have so many parties, uh, uh, there is no, no barrier to uh, uh, you know, for formation of a party. So I think that uh, uh, it, this uh, you know, is not going to be, uh, the certainly greater openness is not going to be a panacea for the problem uh, of corruption in Brazil. And uh, f for sure, uh, the, um, you know, <laughs> current Lava Jato and other inve investigation, uh, if they lead to sustained, uh, uh, you know, penalizing of those who have uh, uh, actually uh, trespassed, uh, will have a very important, uh, uh, you know, deterrent effect. But again, as I said, it's, there is a whole set of reform that needs to be done to ensure uh, that uh, um, you know, corruption is substantially reduced. It will never be eliminated. Uh, in, uh, in no society it is eliminated, but it will be substantially reduced. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Dennis Miller. I am uh, the chief executive officer of uh, Science and Technology International. We've been approached by <coughs> multiple companies in Brazil, well, Brazil, Colombia, and Argentina, about uh, helping uh, with the, the problems they're having with uh, waste, how to change waste to something that's productive in terms of producing renewable power, uh, producing hydrogen, that could be used for solar cells and so forth. Um, the problem we keep running into is financing. No international bank will finance a project in Brazil. Um, then we talk to these businesses and we, as we go deeper and deeper, we find there are problems that we didn't anticipate, for example, uh, they were telling me that, uh, well, we'd like to have you uh, build a plant here. It's going to cost $100 million, but uh, we don't want you to, to manufacture any components in the United States. We want you to, like you were saying, about uh, have local content. And if you don't, then there's these custom issues in terms of what we're going to charge you for importing. And it seems like every, every step of the way, there's a resistance to what we're trying to do in, in terms of helping them. Um, I think what would be helpful, for, at least from our corporate standpoint, would be to try to uh, have the government uh, issue some kind of a document that shows exactly what we can anticipate in terms of doing business in Brazil, who we should be dealing with, and what the problems are in terms of customs, in terms of local content, and um, 
I mean, I'm even having a problem trying to get uh, data on what the cost of power is. You know, there's supposed to be a drought, and uh, hydro generate power is going up, but yet when we talk about producing power, renewable power from waste, I can't get a, com a comparative number. So, I mean, these are some of the problems that at least I'm having. I don't, I don't know about other corporations. Thank you. I'm not sure there was a question there, but... Uh, um well, I, I'd like to know if the government can, in fact, issue some kind of a document that would show what the requirements are for doing business in Brazil. I mean, I, I even had the case where uh, we re negotiated a, a plant and we got down to the last, uh, the last document and uh, the person we were dealing with wanted to, to exclude everybody from the room because he wanted to have a private discussion. The private discussion was, uh, can you uh, pay me now for a signing fee? no one had ever heard about before. And he wanted $100,000 to sign the, doc the document. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things that I'm sure come up time okay. and time again. I understand. I, I think the way I would rephrase your question is, could there be a, a government office that would serve as a one-stop shop for f foreign investors? to understand Brazilian regulations and things like that. I mean, I think that's a good idea. I don't know why there isn't. Uh, I think that would be helpful. What we are doing, the minute, again, we are thinking about ways to improve the business environment so that it makes it less hard to do what you just said. If you want to invest in the US or in some other countries, you, you, you don't have that because they think the market rules are more clear. Uh, or maybe because capital is in the US, you are used to the way American society works. Uh, and you're not used the way Brazilian society works. Uh, I don't know exactly, I'm not a, a businessman, certainly not American. So, uh, um, but I see, I see, I think that seems to be a good suggestion to have an office that helps to promote investment. The other countries have such an office. I remember uh, like Pro Inversion in, in Peru, for instance, is such an office. So th there are things like that and uh, I think can be useful. All right. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Marcelo, uh, Monica, and Teresa, uh, for enlightening us today on some complex but very important issues. Um, keep up the good work, uh, Marcelo. We wish you well. Uh, uh, you don't sound like someone who would get discouraged very easily, so I'm confident <laughs> you will. Uh, thank you all for being here and for the good questions and participation. Um, and your support of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. Anya? Yeah, thank you, Ambassador. Um, again, I would just like to thank everybody who's with us here in the room and online. Our own Brazil Institute Director, Paulo Sotero, is also watching us online, and he sends his thanks for your excellent presentations today. We will be putting together a report shortly on this event, which you'll be able to find online. And I also wanted to announce that next week on Wednesday morning, we will be hosting Ambassador Jaguaribi, who is the head of the Federal Export Promotion Agency, APEX. Um, and the invitation should be sent out shortly, so please watch for that. Thank you again, and I hope you all have a good Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me.